إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوم ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا كبيرا الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على قائد الكل المحجنين نبينا وامامنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اما بعد In continuation from the benefits of the story of Yusuf عليه الصلاه والسلام from the work of Sheikh Abdul Rahman ibn Nasir ibn Sa'di رحمه الله تعالى He says here ومن فوائد هذه القصه أنه يتعين على الإنسان أن يعدل بين أولاده وينبغي له إذا كان يحب أحدهم أكثر من غيره أن يخفي ذلك ما أمكن ولا يفضله بما يقتضيه الحب من إثار بشيء من الأشياء فإن أقرب إلى صراح الأولاد وبرهم به واتفاقهم فيما بينهم From the benefits of this story is that it's mandatory, it is compulsory for someone to be just between his children. To be just between one's children. To treat them in a just and fair manner. And that if the father or the mother loves one of the children more than the rest, if you naturally have a favorite, which in most cases is something that's natural, something that you don't necessarily request or demand. It comes naturally. Whether the child looks like you more, acts like you more, is the brightest, the smartest, the quickest, the strongest, the most responsible, the most obedient. For one reason or another, if you have a favorite child, someone that you're naturally inclined to more than the rest, he says then it's necessary to hide this as much as possible. To hide it, to stifle it as much as possible. And a person shouldn't love a person and be fond of the child so much that he gives him or her more things than the other children. And when a person does this, the following benefits you will reap. Number one, he says is that it has a, you have a greater chance of the children being righteous a greater chance of righteousness of the children. When their father loves them equally, treats them equally, treats them in a just, fair manner, it allows them to be more righteous. And it's one less excuse for them to be wicked, to be disobedient, to do things that are against Allah and His Rasul. He then says, number two, is that it is going to make it easier for them to treat him better, to be benevolent to the father or the mother. Something that is requested in the deen, the religion, let alone something that you naturally want. You want your children to respect you. You want your children to treat you kindly. That's something that you naturally want. So you treating them equally, you being just, is a reason behind that. He then says, third, last but not least, what tifaqihim fi mabainahum, and for them to be in unison. For them to have more unity among each other. Not to stick out one is here, one is there. One is far right, one is far left. For them to be what? One solid unit, one solid body. Because they feel loved, respected, honored equally by the Father. And I don't think anybody with any sense, any experience of children, I want to deny these three points. I want to deny what? These three points. He then says, وَلِهَذَا لَمَّا ظَهْرَ لِإِخْوَةِ يُوسُفَ مِنْ مَحَبَّةِ يَعْقُوبَ الشَّدِيدَةِ ليوسف وعد بصبره عنه وانشغاله به عنهم سعوا في أمر أخ... في أمر وخيم وهو التفريق بينه وبين أبيه فقالوا ليوسف وأخوه أحب إلى أبينا منا ونحن عسبة إن أبانا في ضلال مبين اقتلوا يوسف أو اطرحوه عرضا يخل له مدوى بكم وتقولوا من بعده قوم صالحين For this reason when the brothers of Yusuf when they saw how he treated Yusuf, how he treated them, how he looked towards Yusuf, how he looked towards them. They saw that he had a great deal of love for Yusuf. And that for one reason or another, Yusuf and his uh, love for him preoccupied the father from looking towards them. 
and have any concern and care for them. When they felt this, and when they saw this, it drove them to doing something which was very destructive, very harmful, a very bad act. And that was to take Yusuf from his father, from their father. One of the lies said, Indeed, Yusuf and his brother are fonder to our father than us, even though we are more, even though we're older, even though we're bigger than these two young boys. We're greater than they are, but for one reason or another, our father loves them more than he loves us. Surely, he says, in Abana, our father is in plain error. It doesn't make any sense. He's smaller. He's weaker. He's, he's yeah, we feel, see these, inferior to us. It's more of us, only a few of them, yet still, he loves them more than he loves us. This doesn't make any sense. He's in plain error. So they said among each other, Uqtul Yusuf. They said, get rid of him, kill him. Or throw him out, banish him into a far region, a far land. And when you do this, your father will pay attention to you. He'll see you, he'll look at you, and you won't have to worry about anything afterwards. Afterwards, you'll be salihin. We'll fix the problem, we'll make repentance, it'll just go away like that. وَهَذَا صَلِيقٌ جِدًّا أَنَّ السَّبَبَ الَّذِي حَمَلَهُمْ عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا يُوسُفُ مِنَ التَّفْلِيقِ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ أَبِيهِ وَتَمَيِّزُهُ بِالْمَحَبَّةِ خلاف ما ذكر كثير من المفسرين أن يوسف أخبرهم برؤياه فحسدوه لذلك فإنه مناف للآية الكريمة وسوضا ليوسف حيث استكتمه أبوه وقال يا بني لا تفسس رؤياك على إخوتك في كيد ولا فكيدة أن الشيطان للإنسان عدو مبين He says here and this is clear. He says this makes much more sense than that which some Mufassirin is mentioned in some books of Tafsir is that the reason why they did that to Yusuf was the dream he told them about. He says that makes more sense. The reason why they tried to get rid of Yusuf was they were jealous and envious. And not the fact that Yusuf saw the dream and he told them about the dream. He says for the following reasons. Number one, is that the verse clearly says that he told Yusuf not to do what? Tell Don't tell them. And if he clearly went against his, the orders of his father, disobeyed him, did not take his advice, as if it's a slap in the face to Yusuf. Everybody understand this? He said, so it makes more sense that that was the reason why they did what they did and not Yusuf alayhi salam disobeying his father's clear command, his clear prohibition. Do not tell your brothers your dream lest they make a plot against you. For indeed, Shaytan is an open adversary to man. He then says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, For Yusufu abarru wa aqal min an yukhbirahum biya, wa lakinna kithiru min al-Nisra'iniyati turawwaj ala kithiru min al-Nas, ma'an aqal ta'amunan fi al-Nusus al-Shabariyati yu'limuhum bi putbaniha. Wal maqsud, anna alladhi hamala ikhwata Yusuf ala ma fa'aluhu tamyizu ya'qub bi Yusuf. ومع هذا فلا يحل هذا الأمر الشنيع وهم يعلمون أنه لا يحل لهم ولكنهم قالوا افعلوا هذا الجرم العظيم وتوبوا إلى الله بعده فلهذا قالوا وتكون من بعد قوم صالحين وهذا لا يحل أن يواقع العبد الذنب بأي حالة يكون ولو أضمر عنه سيتوب منه فالذنب يجب اجتنابه فإذا وقع وجبة التوبة منه هي سازير يوسف عليه السلام he had much more sense to do this, to tell his brothers about that dream, that outstanding dream that he saw. And he also had more respect and more obedience to his father than to do that. He says, and there are many different narrations which are called Israeliyat, reports that came down from the Yahud, from the Nasara, one way or another crept into the books of Tafsir, may even crept in some of the books of Hadith and things like this. They become popular, they become widespread. He mentioned this. This companion, this tabi'i, narrated from this Jew of Medina, and it becomes mixed up like this, which is a long discussion in itself. You read Tafsir ibn Kathir, or stories of the Prophet, you'll find narrations which are called Israeliyat. How do you know what Adam did specifically, in detail? It's not mentioned in the Quran or the Hadith of the Prophet Those details came from those narrations. Everybody understand this? The different Tafsir, 
Adam and Hawa and Jannah, the cow of Musa alayhi salatu salam, and many different things like this. Those things came via these Israeliyat, hmm? these narrations of the Jews and of the Christians. Narrations which the Prophet alayhi salatu salam allowed the Muslims to pass on. Hadithu amani Israel wa haraj. Everybody understand this? That's a long discussion we're not getting into right now. What's important is, he says, if the people were to just reflect, to stop and to think about the actual ayat, it will become clear. That was the reason why they did what they did to Yusuf, not because he told them about his dream. He then says, what's important is that that's the reason why they did that, but it does not prove that a person can make a sin and perform an act of disobedience with the intention of making toba, as it was the statement of his brothers. Take Yusuf, kill him, throw him out, get rid of him, and afterwards, you'll be righteous. In other words, they had the intention, the premeditated intention to do wrong, and they said, we want to make toba afterwards. He says, that is unlawful. So another benefit from the story. As many people, they do. He says, I'll make toba, let him on. I'll make repentance afterwards. I'll go here, I'll do this, I'll buy this, I'll say this, I'll sign the contract, and then later on I'll do what? I'll make toba. He says, that's haram. He says, the sin must be avoided. And the person must have the intention to avoid the sin before he does it. If you do the sin, if you fall into the act of disobedience, then you must make toba. Everybody understand this? That is a perverted way of thinking. He says, I'll make what? I'll make toba. It's disrespect to Allah. You're telling Allah you're going to disobey Him with the intention to disobey Allah. You should dis disobey Allah as a means of you fell down, a slipping, a shortcoming. It wasn't your intention. Shaitan overpowered you. Your nafs overpowered you. Huh? Your lust came over you and you shook it off. You snapped out of it. Oh, but that stuff from Allah. You get back onto your feet. Now I'm going to go dive into this sin and then afterwards I'm going to do what? Make tawbah. That makes no sense. He says, so when a person does make an act of disobedience, he or she is to make tawbah. Is to make tawbah. Why is the brothers of Yusuf? They knew that that was haram. They knew it was wrong. They knew what they were going to do to their brother was wrong. They didn't think it was permissible. They knew they were criminals. But it's what happened. Their hearts took over them. He then says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, وَالْعَلَى مِنْ حِكْمَةِ اللَّهِ وَرَحْمَةِ بِيَعْخُوبَ مَا قَدَّرَهُ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْفُرْقَةِ عَلَتِي أَحْدَثَتْ لَهُ مِنَ الْحُزْنِ وَالْمُصِيبَةِ مَا أَحْدَثَتْ رِفْعَةً لِمَقَامَاتِي فِي الدُّنْيَ وَالْآخِرَةِ وَلِتَكُنَ النِّعْمَةُ عِنَّ الْحُسُولِ الْإِشْتِمَاعِ لَهَا عَلَى الْمَوْقِعُ الْأَكْبَرُ وَالشُّكْرُ الْكَثِيرِ وَثَنَاعَ and he says, perhaps from Allah's wisdom is that he decreed what he decreed for things to become even better for Yaqub and better for Yusuf. He says, when Yusuf was taken away from him, he became sad, he was grief strucken he became depressed, so on and so forth. And that was a means of his station being elevated with Allah. And Yusuf, alayhi salam, getting the authority, becoming and taking and having what he had, what Allah gave him. His brothers being unified, coming together after they were split up, after the shaitan had whispered, so that the blessing will be what? Even more solid. The blessing will be even more solid, will be greater. Everybody understand this? And then he uh, mentions the verse in the Quran Kareem, which Allah says, Indeed, you may hate a thing, and it is best for you. You may dislike a thing that's actually good for you. And surely Allah knows, and you knoweth not. And you knoweth not. He then says, From the benefits of the story is using precaution. Avoiding things that you feel will be harmful. Things that you see are going to be problematic in the future. I, will mean. I can see this problem ahead of time. So you try to you try your best to protect yourself or protect your family therefrom. This is proven from the verse in which Allah says, O oh my son, do not tell your brothers about your dream, lest they make a plot against you. Do not tell them what you saw in your dream, unless they will scheme and plot against you. And 
بعد ذلك أخذ عهود أخذ عهودهم وأثقهم على ذلك فالإنسان مأمور بالاحتراس في النفع فذاك ولا لم يلم العبد نفسه He says here another point is when Yaqub specifically addressed his sons if you take Yusuf be careful with him don't be heedless look after him don't neglect him and the same thing happened with his other son, Bin Yamin. He made them swear, he made them promise not to allow what happened to Yusuf to happen to Bin Yamin. He says, so therefore a person should try his best when it's commanded to use precaution. If the precaution helps out, alhamdulillah. And if not, you won't have any regrets. Because you tried your what? You tried your best. I did all that I could do, other along. There was no way that it wasn't going to take place. It wasn't going to happen. But if you don't take precaution, if you're sloppy and nonchalant, if you say, dang, man, what was I thinking? Even though it was also qadr as well. It was also qadr as well. Allah decreed for you not to take your precaution. Allah decreed for that thing to happen. But you're still going to blame yourself. Everybody understand that you're still going to what? You're going to blame yourself. Why didn't I put on my seatbelt? Why didn't I? Even though that's of no use as well. But the mentality of the slave is going to what? It's going to condemn him or herself. But if you did, huh, protect yourself, gear up, I did all that I could do, you say what? It was my destiny to take place. Khairan, inshallah. He then says, وَمِنْهَا أَنَّ مِنَ الْحَزْمِ إِذَا أَرَادَ الْعَبْدُ فِعْلًا مِنَ الْأَفْعَالِ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ جَمِيعِ نَوَاهِي وَيُقَدِّرَ كُلَّ احْتِمَالٍ مُمْكِنٍ from the benefits of the story is that when you are you've made up your mind that you want to do something I plan to do this, I want to do it inshallah I want to take this job and you have a resolute spirit you're determined to do it is that you investigate it thoroughly and you look at all of the different aspects all of the different ins and outs the possibilities, the variables what could, what could not happen you analyze it thoroughly you analyze the situation what? Thoroughly. It's a game plan. This does not go against tawakkul. It doesn't uh, conflict or clash with tawakkul. It doesn't mean that. Everybody understand this? The Prophet ﷺ, he had the strongest tawakkul and then still he planned. He planned in detail. When he left Mecca to go to Medina, he had a thorough plan. Where he's going to hide, the guide, when he's going to leave, who's going to go with him, so on and so forth. When they fought the different battles, they made they had a plan. The battle of Hod was a plan. But Allah has had, there was a plan. And in many other times, we should also something sat down and he analyzed what can happen in this situation. He says, Ihtimalin mumkinin. To the best of your ability. To the best of your ability. Something that you didn't know about, something that you couldn't foresee, there's nothing wrong with that. But sit down, scratch your head, give yourself huh, some time to what? Analyze it. So this, this shows us that being haphazard, being haphazard and unnecessarily hasty, is not from Islam. It is not Islam to be ha to be just sloppy, to just rush into something head first. Everybody understand this? Unnecessary haste. There's a balance. You're not to be huh, a procrastinator, a coward. What if? What if? What if? A naysayer, as many of us are. But 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 no. It has to be a balance. So he says. وأن الاحتراز بسوء الظن لا يضر إذا لم يحقق بل يحترز خير شر. let's move on to the next point. he then says ومنها الحذر من الذنوب خصوصا الذنوب التي يترتب عليها ذنوب أخر ويتسلسل شرها كما فعل إخوة يوسف يوسف فإنه نفس فعلهم فيه عدة جرائم. he says another major point from this story is to beware of sins. to beware of making sins. Especially the sins that lead to more sins. Sister sins. He says sins that lead to more sins. Be careful of falling into them. He says here, sins that have an after effect. The evil will continue. Just as what took place with the brothers of Yusuf. He says, number one, the first crime, he says, فِي وَفِي وَقَرَابَتِي وَفِي يوسف. ثم يتسلسل كذبهم كلما جرى ذكر يوسف وقضيته أو قضيته أخبروا بهذا الكذب الفظيع ولهذا حين تابوا وخضعوا وطلبوا من أبيهم السماح 
قالوا يا أبا نستغفر لنا ذنوبنا إنا كنا خاطئين Firstly was against Allah They made crimes regarding the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Then the rights of his parents and his relatives And the rights of Yusuf Lied to the father, disrespected the father, mistreated their brother So on and so forth He says here And then they had to continue to lie The lies didn't stop it didn't just, yani, it wasn't just over with what they did with Yusuf. Every time Yusuf was mentioned, every time what happened to Yusuf, it was brought up, they had to make the same ugly lie over and over again. And for this reason, when everything was squashed, and when it was settled at the end, they said, Oh Father, Ya Abana, seek Allah's forgiveness for us. Indeed, we were sinners. Indeed, we were sinful. He says, Another benefit is that some evil is less than other types of evil. Evil, shar is not on one level. There are things which are more harmful than others. Things that have more vice, what? Than others. He says here, فَحِينَ تَفَقْ عَلَى تَفْرِيقِ بَيْنِ يُسْفُ وَعَبِيهِ وَرَاءَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ أَنَّ الْقَطْرَ يَحْسُرُ بِهِ الْإِبْعَادُ الْأَبَدِي قَالَ قَائِلُ مِنْهُمْ لَا تَقْتُلُ يُسْفُ وَعَلْقُوا فِي غَيَبْتِ الْجُبْ يَمْتَقِتُ بَعْضُ السَّيَّارَةِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ فَاعِلِينَ فَخَفَّفَ بِهِ الشَّرُ عَنْهُمْ أو هكذا مضوء فَخَفَّفَ بِهِ الشَّرُ عَنْهُمْ في أخطاء مطبعية كثيرة He says here uh, and that is because when they wanted to do what they wanted to do most of them held the view that Yusuf should be killed that they should commit murder kill Yusuf and if they kill him they would event, they would eternally remove the problem. They would rid themselves of the problem of Yusuf and his father. He said that when they said this and they had this view, Allah says, he says, Qala qa'ilu minhu. One of them said, don't kill Yusuf. Rather throw him in the well and allow the travelers, allow the people in the caravan to go by and grab Yusuf. In kuntum fa'ilin. He says, if you must do something, if you're You've made your decision to get rid of him, don't kill him, just throw him in the well. That's better than actually killing him. So when he gave that suggestion, he gave this uh, uh, idea, the evil became what? Less. It became less. Them getting rid of him, throw him in the well, is much uh, less. than actually killing. killing him. Everybody understand this? He then says, Rahim al Ta'ala, وَلِهَذَا لَمَّا وَرَدَتُ السَّيَّرَةُ الْمَاءَ وأدرى والدهم دلوه تبشر بوجوده وقال هذا غلام وكان إخوته حوله فقال إنه غلام أبق منا وتبايعوا معهم وشروه بثمن بخس ضرائم معدودة وكانوا فيه من الزاهدين وإنما قصهم إبعاده والتأكيد على مشتريه منهم سورة أن يحتفظ به لألا يهرب. He says for this reason when the travelers passed by and they sent out their scout the one to collect the water before everyone would get to the well. They saw the boy. He says they, they had glad tidings. They were happy when they saw the boy in the well. Uh, and he says, This is a young man in the well. He says the brothers of Yusuf, they were sitting around. They still were waiting to see what was going to happen, who was going to grab Yusuf and take Yusuf. So therefore, they sa he says that they told, they told them, that this is a boy that ran away from us. He ran away from us. A slave, a servant. al muhim he's a disobedient child. He's bad. And that's why they sold him for such a an expensive price. Get rid of him. Take this thing away from us. And you paid such a, a small price for him. It's a handsome, nice little boy. Make sure that he what? Stays with you. In other words, it's a steal. Everybody understand this? You buy a car. I understand this? A very... Very good car, very cheap price. You want to make sure it's you what? Take care of it. Take care of it. I want you to be happy with the car. Don't let the car out of your hands. They wanted to keep Yusuf as far away as possible. So that's why they sold him for such an inexpensive price. He says, وَمِنْ لُطْفِ اللَّهِ أَنَّ الَّذِي أَخْرَفُ بَعَهُ فِي مِصْرَ عَلَىٰ عَزِيزِهَا فَحِينَ رَعَاهُ رَجِبَ فِيهِ جِدًّا وَأَحَبَّهُ وَقَالَ لِمْرَأَةِ أَكْرِمِ مَثْوَاهُ عَسَائِيًا فَعَنَا أَوْ نَتَخِذ وغيرها متجردا من خير وهذا من اللطف بيوسف ولهذا وكذلك مكننا ليوسف في الأرض وليعلمه من تأويل الأحاديث فكان تفرغه عند العزيز من أسباب تعلمه للعلوم النافعة 
He says, and from the lutf, from Allah's courtesy, Allah's kindness, Allah's softness with him, Allah was, was kind with him, he was gentle with him, is that the one who took Yusuf, he sold him again. And it just happened that the one he sold him to was the Aziz of Egypt, this powerful man. Everybody understand this? As some people say, he was lucky. They would say, what? He was lucky. Or they mean actual luck that Muslims don't believe in. Or whether they mean the linguistical concept of luck. I mean, he was fortunate. He was thrown into a well. The man bought him for a few coins, a few shillings. And all of a sudden, this powerful rich man was what? Buys him. Everybody understand this? He says, so when he saw Yusuf, he instantly fell in love with him. He saw that he was a nice young man. And he said to his wife, he says, take good care of him. Raise him correctly. Indeed, he may benefit us one day. Or perhaps we can adopt him as our son. Perhaps we can adopt him as our son. So Yusuf says he was honored by the Aziz and by his spouse. He didn't have to work and slave and toil uh, in the fields, doing this, making his task. He didn't have to do all of that. He was treated like royalty. He says here, uh, and this is from Allah's lutf, Allah's courtesy. Allah's courtesy. When Allah said, and thus, Yusuf. We allowed Yusuf to have stability and to teach him the interpretation of dreams. So perhaps when Yusuf salam, was sitting away from the hard tasks, away from the things that the other people had to do, it gave him time to do what? Study. Study and learn. It's a major benefit when it comes to a talab al -in. You have to be free if you want to be successful in your studies. You cannot be a successful student of knowledge and you're working eight hours out the day. It's not going to happen. Get rid of that dream. Throw that fallacy out of your head. If you think you want to go to Medina, teach English, go work out of the gym, eat at McDonald's, eat here, do this, have fun, play basketball, play soccer, and then study and master your study. It's not going to work. You have to devote yourself to your studies. You don't have a such thing as study time. You have a time to sleep, you have a time to eat, a time to talk to your family back home. It's limited, everything else goes to study. study. There's no such thing as study time. As the question comes all of the time, how many hours after day should I study? How much hadith should I read? How many, there's no such thing as that. You make a limit on how much you what? Eat. You make a limit on how much fun you have, recreation, keep your body healthy or whatever the case may be, whatever that means. Everybody understand this? Everything else has to go to your studies. So if you don't have to fuddle, if you're not free and void of those things, it's going to have an effect on your what? On your studies. And the same applies to wealth as well. Money. A talib al needs money. He needs funding. Because he's worrying, stressing about bills, about this, how the pampers for his child, his wife, his books. That stress has an effect upon his memory, clear. Everybody saying this? The memory, when you're stressing, Huh? It's going to have a, it's going to weaken your memory. It's going to weaken the sharpness of your mind. And you're not going to be able to suck up as much information as possible. So if there's a brother who goes overseas from your community, it's upon you to support him. It's upon you to look after him. Physically, spiritually, give him support, and financially send him money. We're the brothers at the Masjid, 10 brothers, here's some money that we sent you. Less stress, more hadith. Less worries, more Quran. Just focus on your studies. Actually. Don't worry about money. Everybody feel this? And the same applies to da'wah as well. Da'wah has to be supported, has to be funded, and also Khalid, it has to be protected physically. There's no da'wah without money, without muscle. There is no successful da'wah unless it is funded well, unless it is protected well. Those who are propagating, those who are calling, they have to feel safe. Someone's gonna attack them, someone's gonna try to beat them up. Not saying they can't defend themselves. Not saying that, but it's a general concept. You're worrying, looking over your shoulder. You don't have time to perfect your what? Your, your craft, your skill. Everybody understand this? And the same applies to the dunya as well. Technological breakthroughs, science, medicine. These things were done when the country was in a state of what? Peace. War is destructive to science. War is destructive to medicine because the laboratory is blown up. Everybody understand this? The physicists, the chemists, they're persecuted. They read the history. This chemist, this physicist, this scientist, he was persecuted. So he didn't have time to sit down and take the years and the hours and the countless nights 
the sleep is nice, perfecting this formula, perfecting this invention, perfecting this piece of technology. So you have to be free, you have to be safe, you have to be protected in order to what? To succeed. Khayran, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He then says, Rahimahu wa ta'ala, Kama anna ru'yahu muqaddimatul lutf, wa kama anna allaha wa ilayhin alqa ikhwatu fil jub. Khayran, inshallah, let's move on to the next point. Wa minha, anna al-ibrata fi hal al-abdi bi kamal al-nihaya la bi naqs al-bidaya. Another major lesson from the story is that what's important is the end and not the beginning. The end and not the beginning. If you have to suffer a little bit in the beginning, sweat a little bit in the beginning, you may be humiliated a little bit in the beginning, but at the end, what will take place? Everybody understand this? And this also applies to seeking knowledge. You have to humble yourself when you seek ilm. If you seek ilm with pride or arrogance, you're haughty, you're vain, you're not going to succeed. If you look at your teacher as someone who's beneath you, someone that's less than you, I'm better than him, I'm better than her, you're not going to succeed. Or if you're just too, pri too prideful to suffer, to sacrifice. I can't wear these same clothes. I come from America. Wallahi, I've seen this with my own two eyes in Medina. Wallahi, mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. I'm not going over there. I'm not staying that long. Brothers said, in America, I had a good job. Wallahi, I had a good job before I came to me. I wasn't like you, Mufti. I used to work here. I used to make this money. I was the man. I had all this stuff. I didn't come over here to starve and be a portion of the knowledge, to be a translator. Well, a lot of those brothers said that, they weren't successful. They weren't successful in their studies because they had too much pride. They looked at the current state instead of the what? The outcome. Everybody understand this? As Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, he says, man talaba al-ilma, he says, those who seek knowledge and they humble themselves, he says, tuliba azizan. At the end, he, people will look for him, they'll search for him strenuously. They'll call for him, they'll beg for him. Uh, he'll have to refuse places, what? To go, so I don't have enough time, I'm sorry. But you can't do that unless you humble yourself from the beginning. So therefore, what's important in life is not the beginning, but the what? The end. That's what's most important. And the same applies to the dunya as well. 12 rounds in a fight. Nam. It's not important, the first round, the second, or the third. The points that you lost, you were knocked down, whatever, you were cut, whatever happened. What's important is the final outcome, the last round, the score, the knockout within, huh? The last couple of seconds. You need, you need some examples, Khalil? <laughs> no, sir. No, Are you sir. sure? <laughs> yes, brother. Okay, tell me that. Just check it. Uh, just for you to know. Why? Right, we give you some examples of some classic fights that would uh, totally turn upside down. Hey, inshallah? No. Hey. So, therefore, it's a very important concept in life, especially for the Muslim. Especially for the Muslim. What's important is the end and not the beginning. Khair, inshallah. Move on to the next summarized point. He says, Women had takmiru Yusuf sallallahu alayhi wa marati was sabr. Is that Yusuf alayhi salam, he perfected and he mastered all levels and types of patience. Every type of patience that there was to be practiced, Yusuf did it. He practiced it and he practiced it thoroughly. He says, From them, a sabru littirari, wa sabru ala adhiti ikhwatihi, wa ma taratib alayhi min bu'dihi ala alwayn, wa sabrihi fisijni bil asineen. He says, first and foremost was the patience that he had no choice. Involuntary patience. It was nothing that he could do about Abu Sayyid. And that was the harm of his brothers. They threw him in the well, he was locked up in the jail, so on and so forth. There was no what? There's no option. If you're in a place, you're in a situation in which you cannot change, what is the point of being mad and frustrated and cursing and growling? It's of no failure. You have to be patient. So you might as well what? Make your nafs patient and say you're going to be here for some time no matter how angry you get you can bang, bang on the walls but you're what you're going to be here so you know what I'm going to listen to let me settle myself down and make the best out of the situation he says he says and then there was the voluntary patience the patience that he chose to practice which he didn't have to he could have taken another route he could have went another avenue but he says I'm going to do what I'm going to be patient صبره على مراقبة سيدته مرة عزيز مع وجود الدواء الطويل من جمالها ولو مصيرها وكونها هي التي وردت عن نفسه وغلقت الأبواب وهي في غاية ريعان الشباب وليس عنده من قرابته ومعارفه الأصليين أحد ومع هذه الأمور ومع قوة الشهوة منعه الإيمان الصادق والإخلاص الكامل من واقعة المحظور 
An example of this is the wife of the Aziz. Everything was against Yusuf. All odds were against Yusuf. First and foremost, she was extremely beautiful. One may say, how do we know this? In most cases, the Aziz of Egypt is not going to have a what? A bad looking wife. In most cases, in the culture of people. King of this country, huh? Asia, Africa, South America, the man of power and esteem, in most cases, want to have a what? A fine lady. In most cases. He says that's first and foremost. Secondly, she was prestigious. She was rich. She was powerful. He says, thirdly, she was the one who wanted him. Everybody understand this? You want a woman. It's hard enough to resist it. Now the woman is what? Attacking you. Coming at you. It's even what? It's even more the pride, the ego of a man. Like, well, I can't turn it down. Man's gotta do what a man's gotta do. And all types of statements and cliches that a person is going to make. Everybody understand this? He may not want to, but the fact that she's after him is what? Now, uh, you're a punk, sucker, you're gay, this and that. All types of things Shaitan is going to throw into your head. She's throwing herself on you. You have to take the opportunity. He says that's another odd against Yusuf. He then says, also, she was the one who closed the doors. She made the privacy and the seclusion. And Yusuf was a young man, a fine young man. He had no relatives. He had no original family members there. He was a foreigner. Hmm? He wasn't from that land. He had no brothers and sisters, people that would know about him and discover and tell. And this is something which prevents a person from doing a sin. There's no doubt about that, being embarrassed. People who find it out about me. Uh, the shame of my parents, my tribe, my family members. They want to hear about it. The taqwa may not be enough. The taqwa may not be enough. But the embarrassment, what? will be strong enough. Shyness and shame. Yusuf had no worries. Everybody understand this? People, they go out of town to do what? Make sense. They go out of the country to do what? To make sense. Nobody knows you. Take off your thole, huh? Nobody knows you. Everybody understand this? You can do whatever you want to do. Wear, wear normal clothes. Go, drink, eat, smoke, whatever you want to do. Because nobody what? Nobody knows you. No one's going to say, Omar, what are you doing here? Tucking that. He says here, and upon all of this is Yusuf alayhi salam. He says there was a strong shahwa, strong lust from her and from him. From her and from him. He says the only thing that stopped him was his true iman. He says the pure ikhlas is the thing that kept him back in which all of the cards were what? Uh, stacked against him. He has no way that he was supposed to leave unscathed, but he did. Because of his iman, was strong, was powerful. وَهَذَا هُوَ الْمُرَادِ لَوْلَا أَرْعَى بُرْحَانَ رَبِّهِ فَهُوَ بُرْحَانُ الْإِمَانِ أَلَدِي يَغْلِبُ جَمِيعَ الْقُوَى النَّفْسِيَةِ Allah Akbar He says, and this is what Allah means when He says, if it wasn't for the fact that He saw the burhan, the proofs of His Lord. He says, the proofs of Iman which can overpower all other powers, all other means of strength. There's nothing that can defeat Iman. That's the sharpest, most unbreakable sword. It can cut through anything. If it's properly used. If it's properly what? Wielded. If it's properly forged. If your iman is that powerful, nothing can overcome you. Not what the kufar say. Not what they do. Money. This, that. Nothing can distract you from the true what? True guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He then says, فَكَانَ هُوَ مُقَدِّمَ السَّبَعَ الَّذِينَ يُذِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ذِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ذِلَّ إِلَّا ذِلُّهُ وَرَجُلُ دَعَتُ مُرَاتٌ ذَاتُ مَنْصَفٍ وَجَمَالٍ فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهُ He says here And for this reason, this type of man will be the very first of those He says what? Or oh, he'll be from those who are put under the shade of Allah on the day in which there's no shade except for Allah's shade as it states that a man whom a beautiful and powerful woman invites to zina and he tells her, I fear Allah. That's the only thing that's stopping me. Afraid of the people, I'm weak, I can't, none of those things. He says what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the only thing that stops me from doing this. Everybody understand this? Because of the strong iman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that. Ameen. Khayran insha'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He then says, وَمِنْهَا أَنَّ الْإِخْلَاصِ لِلَّهِ تَعَالَىٰ أَكْرُ الْأَسْبَابِ لِحُسُولِ كُلِّ خَيْرٍ وَانْدِفَاعِ كُلِّ شَرٍ Another benefit is that sincerity to Allah and for Allah is the greatest reason for getting all good 
and being protected from all evil. Next point. Women have madarat alayhi qissatu min amri bin qara'in and qawiti min indati wujuh. Khairan, inshaAllah. Um, Al-Muhim. There are many other fawaid. We will suffice ourselves with this tonight because we normally run out of time with regards to the questions that the brothers and the sisters, they have those online and those who are in person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. We ask him the sublime and the most high to allow us to benefit from the story and live in its shade. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Jazakumullah khairan. How can how can gain hope? How can gain hope and good outcome when the struggle when they struggle with feelings of despair? With regards to despair, we have to understand that despairing is not from the ways of the believers. As Allah mentions in the Quran, those who despair from Allah's rahmah are not the believers. Allah describes them as people who are astray. Huh? Those who do not believe in Him. The believer always has hope. And he realizes that when you lose hope, that's another sin in itself. And Allah the Exalted tells us, Wa rahmati wasi'at kulla shayf. He says, My mercy is ever expansive. It outstretches all things. All what? All things. All things. Allah says, Kulushi, everything. So no matter how many sins you have, please with the children in the class, we say what? All children, we say what? The distraction from Shaitan. We say what? No matter how many sins you have, no matter how bad of a person you feel that you are, Know that Allah's rahmah is greater, is bigger, is more. And there were people that came before you that did things that were worse than that what you do. And Allah forgave them and guided them and took them to paramount status. Paramount status. The Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, kufr. If you're a Muslim, ask me that question. I don't think the sins that you're making are worse than what? Shirk and kufr. Allah forgave them, Allah guided them, and Allah transformed them. They became different people after that iman. Everybody understand this? No. So Allah's mercy is more than anything that you could be going through. Anything. Anything that you're going through, Allah's mercy is greater and stronger. It can't outdo Allah's rahmah. Keep this on your mind. And despairing is a means of you submitting to your enemy. Submitting to your what? Your to your enemy. Giving up to shaitan. And a true soldier, a true warrior, a true combatant, he never gives up to his enemy. He never submits to his enemy, ever. Even when he's captured by his enemy, he's plotting on what? Escaping. Not just escaping. Escaping and causing them harm. Even if it means him going to do some more harm. Somebody is what? Did you say what? Everybody understand this? Everybody clear this? This is a very important concept. That's the true warrior. He never loses the spirit. They can lock him up, they can beat him, they can torture him. The moment I leave this jail, I'm going right back to my campaign against you. And if I fall, someone's going to come behind me. So you can't ever give up and, and, and turn over yourself to your, to your enemy. And who is a greater enemy than Shaitan? The one who solemnly swore to your forefather, Adam, alayhi salam, that he would mislead all of his progeny. All of them. Except for those who are sincere and chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's my advice to you, is to read the Qur'an al kareem Read what Allah tells us about His mercy, about the spirit from His mercy, about shaitan and his plots, and about the believers that lost hope, that gave up, and how Allah had delivered them uh, in the most needy time, as we say, in their darkest hour. Allah ta'ala. Okay. Yes. So is the uh, hadith about the, the shade, the seven, is that in reference to Yusuf, or is it just like a coincidence? The hadith with regards to the seven individuals that will receive Allah's shade on the day in which there's no shade except for that of Allah, the shade of Allah, the shade that Allah gives and provides, 
subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not necessarily speaking on Yusuf alayhi salam. Whereas Yusuf is a Nabi Kirim alayhi salatu salam. So whether you call it coincidence or not, it's the same concept in the same scenario. But he, but he fulfills all the criteria. A man who is under the situation of pressure. A beautiful woman, a powerful woman, calls out to him. And he says, he says what? Inni akhafu Allah afir Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do all of the situations pertain to Yusuf? No. They're different things, such as al-imam al-adil, a just imam. Yusuf, he was, he had authority and leadership, but he wasn't always necessarily the imam, the leader of all of them. Or two men who meet each other for Allah and separate upon that. Wahakada. Wahakada. Whether it's this or whether it's that, there are seven types of individuals, seven categories, that shall receive the shade on that day. As the Prophet has mentioned in this authentic hadith. Wallah ta'ala ala. Follow. Um, just on the question on um, uh, making intention to, 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 to ask for forgiveness, um, you know, after you've committed a sin. Um, can, can, what does that mean? I mean, in you other said words, before the sin, that boy means. Before the sin, yeah. So, so for it's example, a difference, a huge difference between the two. Yeah. So, for huge example, difference, huh? I know two. you're clear. You may have made a sin, but people, it's a difference between the two. Asking Allah for forgiveness with the intention of doing what? Sinning. Making the sin. It's not the same as it happened. But what, it, yeah, that's what I mean. But before the sin. So, like for example, you know, for example, let's say you're you're in need of money. Okay. A brother says, and you and you want to borrow this money. You know you can't pay the brother back, but you need the money. So you tell the brother, I'll get it to you, inshallah. And then you make this intention, oh, Allah, forgive me. I know I can't pay the brother, but, you know, I need this money. So, you know, I'll, I'll make repentance after. If somebody is compelled to do something, that's one thing. In the concept of compulsion, when it's compelled, that's a different story. And there are specific rulings in the Islamic Sharia for compulsion, let alone not even being compelled, but just having a need, hajjah. A need towards a thing. Time for the end now? No. Assalamu oh. alaikum. Brothers, uh, I just want to, for those brothers who come all the time with Brother Muhammad Munir, I want to apologize for them for the incident last week. Wasn't anything took place, was intentionally. Brother Muhammad Munir, we love him, we invite him to our masjid. He have very clear vision. His minhaj is very clear. Whatever he's teaching, the people are getting benefit. If you go down to the basement, this moment, while Muhammad Munir is giving the khutbah, the dars, the brothers who are down now, they disconnect the, the lecture because some of them, they have something else. So if you go down while Muhammad Munir is giving the khutbah, the dars, those who are down, they don't hear nothing. This is what happened last week. When the time came, we don't hear no lecture and misunderstanding came and nobody told us that the lecture is going to extend it to a little bit more time therefore we call the Iqama we have no any intention to disrespect no. Muhammad Munir or you brothers and for it for the sorry for the inconvenience and inshallah brother Muhammad Munir he is loved by the community and you brothers who came with him who, who come with him all the time sometimes you come with him and we don't have even brothers in the masjid here later on the brothers come so you're welcome. Don't let shaitan involve and make our, our class, our, our brotherhood, you know, look bad. Please, we human beings, the Prophet said, كُلُّ بْنَ آدَمْ خَطَّاءُ وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّائِينَ التَّوَابُونَ Every sin, a son of Adam, daughter of Adam, are sinners, and the best of the sinners, the one who repent and seek, inshallah, tawbah. So whatever we did is nothing as a kind of disrespect, it's a mistake, fault, error, and we apologize for that, and we will continue, inshallah. We need to see you more, and inshallah, tell us in advance. Muhammad Munir, his lecture is going to stay until 10 o'clock, half an hour more. We have no problem, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. <laughs> and a human being. I am taking the responsibility as a human being. It was a mistake, and it's not going to happen again, inshallah. And we learn from it. And shaitan wants to come to divide us, but inshallah, we remain together as brothers, inshallah. Please forgive us. Forgive me. Okay? Assalamu alaikum. Where's the Mu'adbi? You just continue until the Mu'adbi comes. We say that 
if you're compelled to do something, then that's one thing. But even in the state or the time in which you're compelled to do something, that doesn't mean that you can lie <laughs> unnecessarily. You, you're telling the brother that you're going to pay him back, knowing that you don't have the means of paying him back. You don't say that. Tell the brother, I don't know if I can pay you back, Akhi. Can you help me out? Instead of asking for a loan, ask for assistance. Instead of asking for a loan, asking for what? Assistance. For assistance. And that's best. That's Allah says in the Quran. Wa anta sadaqu. Allah says, and for you to give it as charity, it's best for you, if you only but know. <coughs> so therefore, a brother who has a hard time repaying, repaying the debt, Aslan, it should be yani, sliding upon him. So you, as a needy Muslim, first and foremost, ask me for money. Something that you shouldn't do unless it's a necessity or need. Number two, if you know your situation and you're not going to have the money, in most cases, and Allah knows best, you tell the brother up front, listen, Abu Sayyid, I need some help. Can you help me with this book? I'm not saying that I'm going to pay you back. Pay you back. No. Can you fund the book? If he says, I can, I'm doing that. Allah accepted from him and he helped you out. And if not, it's just that simple. It's no need to lie, to promise someone that you're going to pay back the money and have no intention of doing it. And that's mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet with regards to being wary of debts. And when a person takes a debt, he makes promises and he breaks them. He makes a promise and he breaks them. I'm going to pay back next week. Inshallah, um, yeah. And you know he doesn't have the money. So be, be careful of what? Of debts. Not that's an nifaq. But a person's under pressure. He's under pressure. He doesn't want to upset the brother, so he tells him, I got you, I got you, inshallah, on Friday. The money doesn't come on Friday. He knows that he's not going to, but he's trying to. By time. I, I get that. So, yeah, I mean, any sin that a person is doing, he should not premeditate that sin. If you fall into it, you fall into it. Try your best to have your guard up at all times. Everyone saying this? He's saying, what? Well, sucker punch. You know what a sucker punch is about me? Yeah. You sure? Maybe hey. <laughs> <laughs> different culture. Why do they call it a sucker punch? Because what? Yeah, <laughs> suck it in. You're not, you're not ready for it. Sucker punch. Huh? And you didn't have your guard up. You're a sucker punch. It's not the same as the punch that you get hit. What? Your hands up. You're, you're embracing it. You're drilling it. It's not the same. Yeah, you understand? The same applies for sin. You have to have your guard up against shaitan at all times. What if he overpowers you? Should you and you know you, you know you're gonna commit the sin before he's overpowered you. you Don't say that. Sin. Just make the tobo once you make the sin. Once you make, but not before. No. That's disrespect to Allah. Mm. Oh Allah forgive me, then you go and that. Yeah. Don't do that. Well long time out. Welcome to peace. Question says. <laughs> what was the end of Yusuf when the king gave him the rule of the warehouses? And did Yusuf come together with his wife? We say the story of Yusuf, alayhi salam. All that we have is what's mentioned in the Quran of Aziz and the authentic hadith of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam. If there are other details mentioned in what we said, the Isra'iliyat, the those narrations of the Jews and the Christians that coincide with the Quran, that are consistent with the Quran, or even not even consistent, they don't go against the Quran, that's one thing. That which goes against the Quran, that which does not make sense, that which sheds a bad light on the prophets and the messengers, we reject. So what we have about Yusuf is what Allah told us. And surely it's more than enough for what Allah told us in the Quran. That's sufficient. <coughs> How many stories do you hear? Or fables that you hear as a young child and you don't know all of the details, but you know what? The outcome. That's what's most important, is the moral of the story. Is the what? The moral of the story. You don't need to know every single detail to benefit from the story. Question says, was the brothers of Yusuf forgiven for plotting the sin against Yusuf, being that they plotted the sin? We know that. We mentioned this. He, they asked the father to make it still plot for them. Allah, he united them. He, Gathered them, they came back together. He's says, after the devil whispered between me and my brothers. After Satan whispered between us. Allah Ta'ala. Any question here? How, uh, can you give advice on how to overcome procrastination and seeking knowledge? How to overcome procrastination and seeking knowledge is to realize the worth, the worth of knowledge. The worth of knowledge, the value of knowledge. It's not something that comes easily. 
Nothing good comes for free. Nothing good comes in for cheap. And anything cheap isn't good. So you're seeking knowledge. As the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam says, Man sanaka tariqan yaltamisu fihi ilma sanaka Allah bihi tariqan ila jinnah wa kama qala alayhi salatu wasalam. Hadith Abi Huraira, Sahih Muslim. He says, those who seek knowledge, Allah will make it easy for them, a path to paradise. So paradise, as the mission of hadith, is what? Sil'atullah. Is the product of Allah, the merchandise of Allah, the goods of Allah, sila, something that you wish to buy, a commodity. And it says that indeed this product is expensive, ghaliya, <clears throat> it's costly, and it's paradise. So you're not going to go to paradise just by sitting home, twiddling your thumbs and your fingers, relaxing, eating, and drinking. It doesn't work like that. As the Prophet says, Hufatim Jannah to bin Makarim. Paradise is surrounded by hardships. And hell is surrounded by difficulties. So, excuse me? You said hell. Hell is surrounded by shahwat, excuse me. Now, Jazakallah khairan. By desires, by lust. So we say paradise and seeking in are connected, as we just explained. And paradise is expensive and costly as we just explained. And the hellfire is cheap and easy. So just keep this one in your mind, no student of knowledge. Every second, every minute, every hour, every day that you don't study, that you don't pick up your books and go out and travel, that you're in America, you don't go to Medina, you, I wanna apply, inshallah, I'm waiting for this letter of recommendation, I'm waiting for this to get translated, inshallah, I'm gonna learn, inshallah, inshallah. Every day, you're getting further and further from your goal. And the shaitan is getting more and more power against you. And you lose more steam. You lose more momentum. And the shaitan gains more steam and more momentum against you. And then your nafs is going to take power now. When you try to move out, you try to take the initiative, your nafs is going to tell you, you know you're going to quit. You know you're going to stop. You know you're not serious. We both know that you're not going to follow through on this. And then you fall victim of your own nafs. So that's my advice. Is to keep in mind what is the purpose of seeking knowledge. Seeking knowledge is a way to Jannah. Jannah doesn't come cheap, doesn't come uh, for free. It takes sacrifice, it takes struggle. So just think about the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thereafter for seeking in. Let that be the battery in your back. subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for further benefit, please go back to the lecture that we we did uh, in uh, uh, we did it over uh, maybe two years ago, Maryland on the dispraise of procrastination. It's on the channel, Hadith Disciple. I'm talking about the dispraise of what? Procrastination. Tasweef. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Actually, we could add that. I want you to tell the brothers about the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. They came with a shirt with blood. Even though they said the wolf ate him, how come they came with a chair and there is no any chair? Tear on it. I like that. Yeah, so. Fine. I'm sure. Allah, what for Allah, what for Allah, what for Allah, what for Shadullah, Allah, Allah, Shadullah. محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا brothers and sisters briefly we said that the video we did I believe is uh <coughs> Mashid al Ihsan now mm -hmm. on the outskirts of Baltimore we did on the dispraise of procrastination from a book entitled 
hawaiq al talab obstacles and hindrances of the student of knowledge. By Sheikh Abdul Salam ibn Barjas, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. One of the modern day books on some of the do's and don'ts of seeking knowledge. In this book, alayhi wa sallam, uh, doesn't talk about the things that you should do, but it talks about the things that you shouldn't do. And the stops and the road, the things that will prevent you from reaching your goal, Abu Sa'id. The things will do what? Prevent you from reaching your goal. From finishing what? Finishing the race successfully. It's a, a book that I advise all seekers of knowledge to read. Those who can understand the Arabic language and those who may read some translations from it. I don't know, maybe the book was translated. I'm not editing. I know there were some students of knowledge some years back that did classes on the book. We've done a few sessions on the book. And perhaps in the future, Allah will give us the ability to explain the entire book. It's a very beneficial work on the obstacles of the student of knowledge. And from those obstacles, he says, is a tasweef, tulul alam. It's procrastination and overextended hope. Overextended hope. Tomorrow, next week, next year, inshallah, when I turn kada, when I turn this, when I get married, when I get a job, when I learn this, I'm going to go overseas, I'm going to study. I'm going to join the class, I'm going to kada. I'm going to study, I'm going to have a better work schedule. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. And you don't realize every time you say, I'm gonna, time moves. You become older, you become weaker. And your nafs and shaitan, they become what? They become stronger. So you have to be mindful of this. Everybody understand this? Of procrastinating. There's no better time than the present. There's no better time than what? The present, the gift that Allah gave you. Malasa. Allah says what? Buy al -asa. So that's my advice to all students of knowledge. So if you look for the lecture on the uh, channel, I believe the title is uh, The Dispraise of Procrastination, inshallah. And one more piece of advice before we move, move on further. Uh, we noticed that we get a lot of questions about seeking knowledge, which is a great thing, alhamdulillah. About, we get questions about sins, we get questions about advice, what's your advice on this, what do you think about this, what's your opinion on that. My advice is, anybody that seeks my humble view on an issue, my humble opinion, the little bit of advice that I can give, I would advise you to make sure that you watch all of those videos that are abundant, what are that hum, and we're saying this to make a point, and that is many of the things that the people ask about over and over again are explained to what? In detail. In detail. Everybody understand this? In what? In detail. So that's my advice. Brothers who want to learn certain things from me, the little knowledge that I have, they want advice, the little advice that I can give, watch all of those videos. It's more than enough to keep you busy for a very, very, very long time. Watch them again, write them down. And inshallah, we don't say this in a manner of boasting, of pride, but we're just saying Allah's blessings are many for what? That you can come across and you can only get through what? You say, host. Is by diving and digging in. Everybody understands it's a 40 minute lecture. You may have to listen to all 40 minutes and find one minute, like, whoa, that's major. This Imam said this, this companion said that, this hadith said this, external stuff, but you have to listen, you have to read, you have to go out, you have to seek it. We give it to you for free, you have to do what? You have to take it. Well, Allah Ta'ala Alam. As far as the fa'ida that was mentioned by Imam Uthman regarding how the brothers brought the shirt that had the blood on it, and the father, he knew that there was a lie. Whereas when a wolf attacks something or somebody, he bites, he rips, and he tears. A wolf is a very yani, vicious animal, very powerful bite. Zero. Everybody understand this? The wolf is gonna, he's not gonna do a clean, neat job when he's eating something. Everybody understand this? So perhaps we get from this benefit is that when a person wishes to do evil and he wishes to lie and be deceitful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he blinds them. He blinds them and he makes them stupid and foolish. Something so obvious and so basic, they did what? They overlooked it or said fumbled. Something so obvious. You bring a shirt that has no rips in it with blood on it. That doesn't make any sense. Cut it, tear it, do something. Even then, it will be obvious that it's not from the bite of a wolf. That's at least, and this, when you study, you yeah, will say, what? Criminology. Everybody understand this on model? I will say, huh? Most criminals, they get caught, 
because of what? Silly errors. <laughs> Silly errors. And the detective, the investigators, they're trained to pick up and not to overlook what? The smallest minute detail. Everybody understand this? A silly mistake. Everybody clear on this? This is a very important concept. Silly, basic errors that you overlook because you're doing a crime. It involves lust. It involves haste. That's why the best criminals are those that do what? Seamless. That's a moving silence. Allah <laughs> 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 <laughs>